and welcome to the Health Go Live webinar series. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Hypnosis. Just a few housekeeping items to go over. We would like to remind everyone that the Q&A feature will be available, so feel free to send in those questions for the panelists throughout the discussion. Stay on for expert mythologist Natasha, who will be shaking things up with a refreshing cocktail demonstration. And with that, I will throw it over to our moderator who joins us from Ingenium Digital Health Advisors, Christian Milaster. Hey, thank you very much for that introduction and thanks for Zypnosis for kind of organizing this event. Uh, really great to be here on stage and be joined um, by, by an uh, engineer and entrepreneur, by uh, a, a nurse and by a physician, because really this is what telehealth and telemedicine is, is all about. So uh, we'll be introducing here the, the panelists uh, in, 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 in a few minutes, uh, but I wanted to kick us off here and really excited to talk about um, how to use the right virtual care tools to improve the provider experience. Um, and it's refreshing to see really the focus shifting on the provider. A lot of uh, conferences, webinars, and sessions have talked about the patient um, and how we need to be patient-centric. And I think we have all that uh, in, in mind. But uh, way too often, in my opinion, uh, the, the experience of the physician is, is being forgotten and of the nurses and all the other people that are involved in delivering care. Uh, at a distance. Uh, my name is Christian Malaster. I'm originally from Germany, German, um, born, raised and educated in Germany, trained as an engineer, came to the US uh, 23 years ago and got my healthcare education in uh, Minnesota uh, at the Mayo Clinic. Um, and then uh, nine years ago, I had the opportunity to, to jump uh, out on my own and started Ingenium Digital Health Advisors, where we now work with digital health companies, service providers, and healthcare organizations to get the most value out of uh, uh, telehealth and to really enable the delivery of extraordinary care. Um, what's really exciting to me about this is uh, when, when I got really introduced to healthcare, um, I, I quickly came across that uh, the, the, the triple aim that was established, right? To improve patient satisfaction, patient outcomes, lower the cost of care. And then somebody very quickly, the community added the fourth uh, aim. And so now it's the quadruple aim. And that is really to also improve provider satisfaction. And I think so much can be done from a systems perspective and a technology perspective to really uh, allow physicians and clinicians in general to practice on top of the license. And that is really um, what, what we're working on uh, every day. And that I know that all the vendors uh, are working on, especially Zypnosis, is really to give uh, the clinicians uh, the right information, the right tools, and make that a great experience. And so really excited uh, to explore that and to contrast that uh, a little bit uh, as we've teed it up here, as you've seen maybe in the description um, of, uh, of, of the various uh, tools that are already available um, to the um, uh, uh, clinicians, um, namely the, the EMR is, is one of the go-to tools, and that's what we'll be exploring here today. Um, but with that um, preamble here, I'd like to invite my uh, uh, fellow uh, panelists here up on the stage. Uh, please, uh, ladies and gentlemen, start your engines, your video engines, um, if you could. Uh, I want to see all of your faces. Great. Thank you very much. So, so my pleasure here to welcome John, Dr. King and uh, Abby here to the stage. Um, Rather than me reading uh, paragraphs of introductions as to how what these wonderful individuals are about, um, rather we thought what we do is, is I'll just post the question um, to each of you, starting with you, John. What have you really experienced, uh, uh, if you can recall for us, over the last uh, year, here, the last 12 to 15 months with regards to telehealth and telemedicine? And before you do that, uh, if you could give us a little bit about your background, your role, um, uh, that would be helpful. Thanks, John. For sure. Thanks. Uh, so I'm John Pierce. I started uh, Zypnosis about 12 years ago, um, really with this intention of helping transform how and where patients and providers connected for care and really kind of saw the cell phone as being that, that clinic of the future. And I think to your, your, your first question there, Christian, is it kind of took a pandemic and, and 12 years to get there and, and start to really see a, a fundamental shift in and how we think about how healthcare is delivered. And so being on the front lines and, and certainly our, our, our business here at Zypnosis where we license the technology to provide virtual visits to healthcare providers gave us a unique vantage point um, throughout this transition as COVID hit, as healthcare providers were being asked to deliver care in ways that they had never contemplated. And virtual care became a, a critical part of that. 
So I think one of the biggest things that I saw this past year was really, I think, a breaking down of a lot of social stigmas, both on the consumer side as well as the provider side. And it sounds crass, but COVID was the best marketing for telemedicine. And it really forced us to kind of get over, I think, some of the, the inertia that we've had as a society and as a, as a healthcare industry. So I'm excited about the potential and, and certainly rolling up the sleeves and having a, a great conversation today. Oh, Christian, you're muted. Uh, yes, thank you, John. Um, I'm reminded uh, as you were talking of the quote by Louis Pasteur, uh, the luck favors the prepared mind, right? So as you said, it took 12 years to get there. And it, it uh, um, I think the other quote that people are getting tired of, uh, other than the new normal quote, um, is uh, never let a good crisis go to waste, right? I think that was tossed around by a lot of people as well. And yes, uh, obviously COVID accelerated this. And it's glad to see, I'm glad to see that people now have the experience and 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 actually saw firsthand uh, how good it can do, but uh, ultimately it is it, it is about the the clinicians and giving them the right tool. Uh, one of the key points that I always emphasize is that telehealth is, is not about the technology; it's a clinical tool, and it should be real at that. And so, um, Dr. King, uh, Catherine, um, uh, if you could uh, briefly introduce yourself and kind of share with us that from your perspective, from your vantage point as a clinician, as a leader in telehealth. Uh, how did the last 12 to 50 months unfold for you? Sure, sure. So I'm Katie King. I'm the Associate Executive Medical Director um, at our Center for Telehealth at the Medical University of South Carolina. Um, and uh, I'm a pediatrician by training uh, with a public health background. So now I do a lot of designing and implementing telehealth programs across the state. And certainly in the last 12 months, I think we just saw the barriers really come down. We used to um, really, uh, we've all been laughing that we had this slide that we all use that talked about what are the barriers to telehealth? What are the clinician barriers? What are the, the um, health system barriers? What are the, the patient barriers? And they all came tumbling down. Um, when uh, it really became necessary for clinicians to be able to connect to their patients. And I think that that gets to the heart of, of the issue, which is clinicians want to take care of their patients. Um, and when you strip away the um, reimbursement barriers and you decide that um, the perfect integration um, isn't uh, what should hold you back? You just want to take care of your patients? That's what we did. Um, and that's, that's when we really saw uh, the kind of skyrocketing in the use of telehealth. Um, when you say skyrocketing, uh, are you at liberty to share a number of uh, how the visits from like like February to February or? Oh, I have them um, off the top of my head, um, but certainly um, hundredfold um right maybe. right from from the hundreds or the dozens to the yes. thousands or ten thousand right yes. yeah certainly certainly both in yeah. our um virtual urgent visits and our direct to patient uh synchronous visits yeah okay very good thank you so very much Abby, uh, welcome to the panel here as, as well. Um, uh, if you could also do a brief introduction and just uh, share with us from, from your vantage point, from your point of view, how did you see uh, the COVID-19 health crisis uh, unfold and accelerate telehealth in your world? Sure, thank you. Uh, my name is Abby Lutz and I serve as our Vice President of Operations for Digital Care at OSF Healthcare, as well as our Chief Nursing Officer for OSF On-Call Digital Health. Um, and this last year has been amazing. Just to echo everything that uh, John and Dr. King mentioned, we definitely saw the same trends at OSF Healthcare, but I think that we've really realized that now um, that we've removed the barriers, that we have uh, removed some of that social stigma that John mentioned, we can't move fast enough. And I think that that's what our organization has realized now is that we have figured out how we need to work in a completely new way. Um, we can't develop solutions fast enough. And, and to kind of tag on to your cliche or your saying of a new normal earlier, we've said that, you know, this momentum has really digitally upscaled our entire country in a matter of 12 months. People used their phones and technology before, but now they have all realized how to use a new way of healthcare. And I think that that's toothpaste that you can't put back in the tube. 
Um, so, you know, now we all have to really leverage the momentum that we've had um, and, and move forward very quickly and continue to optimize and develop new solutions because now it's an expectation of our patients, it's an expectation of our providers, um, and, and there's a lot of competition out there. So I would say those are our themes that we've realized at OSF Healthcare. Great, wonderful. And I want to dive deeper in, uh, later on in, into what you said about the new solutions. And actually, but that's an easy ball to toss here to John next. So uh, obviously, uh, um, uh, there are great solutions out there. So John, uh, you, you said you've been on this journey for 12 years and recognized the, the smartphone as, as, a, as a care delivery tool. Um, but really, how, how do you see uh, really the, 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 the position of, of a virtual care specific solution and, and maybe contrast it, if you will, to uh, some of the standard tools? Because a lot of organizations that were out there uh, looked around and said, like, what, what virtual care tool do we have? Uh, do we, okay, somebody has a FaceTime license <laughs> or Skype license or, or, well, doesn't have our EMR, some kind of built in uh, uh, telehealth capability? Oh, yeah, let's turn this on. <laughs> um, and I think that's where a lot of organizations are at. But now that they're coming out of it, they're looking, okay, what is the better solution? So John, share us a little bit about your insights at what, what you've learned on, and designing a very a solution that's specifically optimized uh, for, for that telehealth virtual care experience. Well, you learned that the, the tech is the easy part, right? I mean, building the bits and the bytes is, is you know, what software engineers do. <clears throat> and so I think, especially as we look at, I mean, any industry has been revolutionized by COVID, but telemedicine itself, I mean, you're, it, you're, it's hard to find any other industry at any point in history that's gone through such a radical transformation. And, and I think it's, it's left um, a lot of opportunity, but it's also created um, a lot of, I would say, sort of noise. And to your point, you know, a lot of fragmentation in, in customers, um, especially healthcare providers with 15, 20 different types of solutions and a whole hodgepodge of use cases and business cases and licenses. So I, I think one of the things that, that we've learned very quickly and will continue to learn, I think, um, as we, we understand our partners and customers better is that the right solution um, isn't just about the tech that it's really got to fit within that broader narrative, right, of change. And I think, Abby, that's where you're going to. And so much of this isn't just, is this the right tool for providers? Yes, it has to work well for them. Is it the right consumer tool? But where does it also sit in their shift in value-based care? Where does it shift from a priority, fit within a prioritization there? And so much has changed so rapidly in this world that I think we're all kind of still trying to get our arms around it, right? And so I, I think the, 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 the key takeaway learning is it's going to continue to evolve, right? I think I, right there with you, Abby, the toothpaste is out. We know the trajectory, but we're all just kind of getting our sea legs to a certain degree. And I think that's got to be certainly from, a, from our perspective, being patient, being understanding, and, and being equipped with the questions we think to ask. But I think this market is going to continue to evolve, but be but be a little bit choppy here. Katie, uh, uh, teeing off of that, um, can, can you give us some insights as to, or, or, or shine some light on, uh, how, how did your process at Musk uh, uh, unfold with regards to technology selection? I think, I mean, you already had a head start for uh, much, much earlier. If you've been at it also for quite a long time uh, from what I know, but, but really as now, as, as you had to scale up very quickly, um, what were some of the decisions that were made with regards to the technology and which ones do you uh, celebrate and which ones do you regret maybe? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. And you're right. We, we had been at this for quite a while. We have um, 10 plus years of experience here at MUSC scaling up telehealth programs to meet public health needs in the state. Um, and we had also uh, really... Um, uh, standardize the process by which we stand up a telehealth program um, into a very prescriptive, what problem are we trying to solve um, to go live step-by-step -step process. And I think um, having uh, the technology choice be part of that process rather than um, we have a problem, let's pick some technology um, I think was really important um, and made it possible for us to um, scale up quickly uh, in, in the face of the pandemic and um, pivot 
technology choices we had already made um, in order to meet the needs of the population. Um, so we were able to say, okay, we have a virtual urgent program. We have a tool that um, can screen and get a, an order for testing up and ready to go um, in the next two days. Um, and, and we had that rolled out before testing was even available. Um, we have a remote patient monitoring program that we know works um, and we can monitor patients who are ill and at home and keep them at home and correctly, you know, triage and, and transfer care if needed. Um, we have ambulatory synchronous video visits that can replace in-person clinic visits. Um, let's think about the right tool for that. And that was probably the one that needed the, the quickest scale up. And the answer to that question was very quickly um, a uh, simple, easy to use, um, easy for patients to use from, from a mobile device um, solution uh, that, that we had at our fingertips. Um, so I think really thinking about what is the technology choice in the process of what problem are we trying to solve um, is, is really important. And I think that, that really enabled us to, to react quickly and efficiently. Yeah, and, and I like that statement uh, uh, very much so. So I'm an engineer by training, and as engineers, we figure out what are the requirements, and then we design the solution. And uh, so often, um, organizations, especially uh, health IT departments, are, are uh, looking what solutions lay around and then say, let's, let's, let's use this one here. Um, and so, uh, and that's over the last year, I really coined the phrase, uh, don't put the horse behind the cart. Uh, and I know that as a German, I'm probably butchering that idiom, but it's on purpose. And what I mean by that is don't select a technology uh, before even knowing what you're going to do with it. Um, and so, um, uh, Abby uh, at, at OSF, and then obviously you have a very designated service here, the OSF on-call service. Um, how, how did the choice of technologies unfold at OSF? Sure. So I think we were like a lot of organizations pre-COVID where we had a lot of different solutions sort of living in a siloed, fragmented state, each with a different technology solution. So I think the opportunity that we saw right away was to start streamlining and building around the patient or the consumer experience. Experience, and that's what we've really turned to doing. Um, we sort of always said that we had the patient in the center of everything that we did, but we really started designing every program, every process, every digital response around what is the experience that we're trying to create? So similar to what Dr. King was saying, you know, what are we trying to achieve? We would build out what experience we wanted that patient to have, and then sort of See where we were, what solutions are already in place, are those optimal solutions, and then where are our gaps? Um, and then we would look for technology that would not only fill the gaps that were there, but also look for something that would streamline that experience to be optimal for the end users. So whether that end user was the patient or whether that was our, our own employees, our own providers um, that were seeing, seeing that care delivered. So that's really been the take that we've had. Um, we have really um, also during COVID, I'm sure as other organizations experienced, you were at the mercy of what equipment and what technology was available. Everybody was sort of pining for the same um, resources, you know, and there was only so many resources to go along. Uh, John and his team walked that journey with us um, painfully as we were really trying to bring things up quickly, get solutions in place quickly. Um, and that was something that all organizations were doing. So pining after the same resources and technology was a challenge. So, you know, now we find ourselves looking back to see what really worked well, as you mentioned earlier with, with Katie, um, and what we still need to, you know, sort of shore up because we didn't have the availability over the last 12 months. So, um, you know, our CEO of our healthcare system very early on in the pandemic response um, I quote this a lot. He said, open the digital front door. Um, and we did that. We drove everything digital first during our pandemic response from the very beginning uh, by opening that digital front door using tools like chatbots, digital assistants, 
um, digital screening, driving everything towards digital means to offload, um, you know, all of those phone calls and walk-ins coming in. Any information we could get out ahead by digital means, we felt was a, a huge success in that response. Putting our community's minds at ease early, offering a lot of different options, um, and technology, like, like Dr. King said, being a part of that, looking to see, you know, how the technology could fit the solution that we were trying to do instead of fitting our solution into the technology that we had. Very good point. Yeah, I'm, it's exciting to hear that. So, and, and also exciting to hear that your executive leadership uh, really jumped on board uh, right away. Uh, I worked with a number of organizations where the leadership was more apprehensive, and <laughs> and now we I know where they're at. Um, John, I'm really glad that from a as a as a technology uh, uh, solution CEO, you really emphasized uh, that you said that technology is the easy part, and I totally agree with you. Uh, I say it's engineers that kill me, by the way, but yeah, I, I know, I know, <laughs> but but we're, we're we're still depending on that because if if they knew it were problems we have to deal with with organizational change management, they they would be grateful for the problems that they have to solve. So, and having been on both sides of the aisle, having developed software early in my career, and then now managing organizational change, uh, I, I, I sometimes I wish back I could just manipulate electrons and code lines of code. <laughs> They're a little bit more pliable <laughs> than, than human beings. So, but that's all the, the fun. Uh, I have this Venn diagram where I say it's, it's, it's 10% about technology. And so meaning that uh, obviously we assume it's, it's easy to use, it's reliable, it's secure. Um, that's kind of a given. Um, and then it's 40% about the, the clinical workflow um, because really we need to fit it as we just heard from both Abby and, and, and Katie here, we need to fit it. We need to understand, well, what, what is the patient experience we wanna generate? What is also uh, to stay with the topic of our talk today, what is the physician experience we wanna generate? Right? How do we want physicians to work on top of the license? And what I mean by that is how can we design this, the system in a way that it only that physicians only do the things that only physicians can do. Um, and that would be the ideal state. So, um, and, and then 50% uh, of, of the effort of that, and, and you talked about this, uh, is organization change management, getting people on board, getting them engaged, rolling on training. So, so John, I was very excited to hear that you talked about change uh, right at, from the get-go here. So what have you done or what are you doing in, in either in the design of your solution or in the rollout in your solution to kind of support um, that change uh, with, within uh, an organization? Well, I think it starts for us very, very early on. You know, we, we have experience doing this and we really try to bring the, the narrative, the consumer narrative, here's the experience they're gonna have. They're gonna have a great, you know, uh, satisfaction. Here are some of the issues. You're still, you're providing healthcare, it's a service. You can bring that narrative, you bring the, the, the physician narrative as well. Here's what you're gonna see. Here's how your day is gonna be. Here's the data that we've been able to generate over a decade, right? You're not guessing, it's gonna be a two minute work time. It's gonna give you, you know, 97% adherence to guidelines. And, and that discussion, I think is something that is, these can be longer sales cycles and, and decision points, but I think some of that's also necessary. Um, and the technology is there to support that. And so I, I think for us, making sure that that narrative is there, you can talk about the experience, you can bring enough data to say, yep, it's not just hopes and dreams. And then, and then of course, you know, the technology has to work, right? So that has to be a part of it. Uh, but then we augment it with a, a, a really robust implementation process, right? Where we, we try to anticipate, right? And we sit down and say, here's what we're gonna need to do to kind of help get through it. And it's never, you know, it's never all perfect. And the plan is the same that we generally have for everybody. But as these guys know, and everybody here knows, it, it, it is you know, somewhat customized around it. But I think honestly, the, the, the conversation has to start early. You have to have the buy-in, you have to be able to, to have the team, whether or not, especially clinical leaders, have their voice at the table to say, here's why we want it. And I can tell you in the, the places where we're successful, that gets answered really early. The places where we're not successful or we're not chosen as a vendor, that question is never, we never answer that with, especially from a, a clinical perspective. Very, very good point. So, so Katie, uh, you mentioned that you have a standard uh, process also for launching 
Um, but uh, John kind of mentioned here at the the variations, uh, and it's and it's never always a, a great success. Can you talk a bit and provide a little guidance here you know, uh, um, uh, for 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 our audience? Uh, so that is obviously desirable to strive for a standardized process, but in reality, uh, uh, what what does that look like when you launch a new telemedicine service? Sure, sure. Well, I think it it starts with a really important process. Um, that is, uh, and I keep going back to this, what is the problem you're trying to solve? Um, and I think very similar to, to what John just said. Um, and then who are the key stakeholders and does it adversely affect any of the key stakeholders? Um, and so then you have, you have um, really kind of set the stage for everyone has bought in. Um, we have, we have, a, a very clear um, goal in mind, um, a problem to solve, and everyone has bought in. Um, and then we step through, okay, um, what is the right um, technology solution? Uh, and luckily we, we have a, you know, a, a good many of those at our fingertips. Um, what uh, are the, the legal, regulatory compliance um, issues we need to think through? What is the right business case? And, and we kind of step through that process one by one um, with our development team and the clinical team that will be involved. Um, and, you know, with a, a lot of checks and balances along the way um, and, uh, and a, a, a good plan for the the go live um, process. So that's kind of what it looks like. And I think really basing it in, um, again, uh, a, a common goal in mind and then buy-in from all the key stakeholders uh, is, is really what, what makes it successful in the end. Great, thank you. So we've got already some questions lining up here, which we'll uh, take on in a minute, but I wanna do uh, uh, and maybe a, a, a brief uh, flash round here about uh, one specific feature that uh, I get asked about uh, occasionally, um, and that's uh, virtual waiting rooms. Um, so, Abby, I'm maybe starting with you. What is uh, what is your opinion and your experience and and your whole thinking around uh, uh, a virtual and uh, digital online uh, waiting rooms? Thank you for that. I think that this is one of the most important pieces that has to be flushed out. I think it's an ongoing process. And I know that John mentioned earlier that a lot of organizations are still working through some of the kinks as we have done this so quickly. But, you know, I think we've all heard stories about a patient who is waiting in the waiting room, right? Their virtual waiting room, and they don't know if they've done something wrong. No one's showing up. How long should it be? No one is communicating with them during that process. They don't know um, if it's working correctly. So these are all things that you need to consider. Um, and again, it goes back to how our team works on, on that patient experience side. What is the experience that you want the patient to have? And then you go from there and you want the patient to be informed. You want them to know that things are working correctly. You want them to be updated and communicated with along the way. If there's something that's not going well, um, you want to provide some sort of reassurance during that time that um, they are in fact going to be seen and that this experience is happening. Um, you know, the, the technology tools that are available now have some awesome features in being able to actually contact patients so that maybe they can forego that virtual waiting room even. And I think that that's something that um, is, you know, cannot be minimized because we're all busy. We want to go on to the next thing. Um, and so I, I think that all of those things should be considered um, as you're creating that experience for your end users. Great. John, um, uh, you reacted immediately here with a, with a big smile and you're holding on to that. Uh, what's your take on virtual waiting rooms? Well, I, I, I don't think they should exist. I think Abby's going right there. I mean, let's be honest, if you're waiting around, something isn't working, right? The, this isn't, that isn't the type of experience. It's a reality. I get it, you know, and we all wait in line somewhere. But I, I think the as an industry and, and, and as we get better at that, we'll look back and be like, wow, <laughs> we used to have waiting rooms. You remember that? You know, it's kind of like rewinding your VHS cassette. And, and I think that will be, I think that will be the reality. And, 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 I, and again, I, I look outside of healthcare for where are the standards already set and you don't wait in waiting rooms and most of your e-commerce, right? If you do, you're gone, right? And that, that kind of experience needs to become more standard here in healthcare. Yeah, great, very good. 
Katie, uh, from, from MUSC's perspective, uh, how are you dealing with the uh, waiting rooms? Uh, well, I, I'll just say that I really enjoy the um, conversation that just went on. So I, to me, the two key points, and, and that's the conversation we've been having here, is um, what do you want the patient experience to be? I'm stealing that now, Abby. That's so perfect. And the man with the plan was like, no waiting room. That's what I want the experience to be. Um, and I, I think that that's where we are. Um, I say to clinicians all the time when I talk to them about what, what their vision for a telehealth program would be and say, can you, you just wipe the slate clean? Can you just put this image that we were all talk, taught in medical school about the way we manage patients is in 15 minute increments every three months, make that go away. If you could just ask your patient one question every day, could you manage their care better? And what would that question be? Um, and so wipe that slate away. Don't say, how do I replicate the broken system that we have digitally? And just say, no, what would this look like? Um, and, and I love what John said, it, no waiting room is what it would look like. Yeah. D digitizing chaos just gives you faster chaos. <laughs> so, uh, so that is not the solution, John. Well, and, and I think it's, I, I think you're right on the, right on the cusp of moving in two things that are happening. One is we're moving away from this idea that we're doing healthcare in these discrete little events, right? These 15 minute increments. And that's what healthcare is. And we're moving into this stream of data that's going to be available to me as a consumer patient, to physicians to be able to interpret that. And I think to your point there, Dr. King, you, you have to reimagine, it doesn't fit in that little incremental box anymore. And concepts like the waiting room are just the holdover, right? The carryover from that old world. And for us to really be able to embrace a digital world, we have to, we have to wipe some of those free. And I think the second thing too, and, I, and this is, you know, I think a big part of decisions to go with whatever solution is we're also moving away in various ways, right? On fee for service to fee for value and how you look at valuing the healthcare interactions are, are radically changing um, underneath us as well. And I think when you put those two together, you're gonna see virtual care evolve in ways that are gonna be very, very different um, over the next five to 10 years. And, and I think to this point, the virtual waiting room will be no more. That will just be an artifact. Yeah, very good. Abby, did you want to comment? Christian, I would just mention, just to kind of tag on to everything that was just said, is that really lends to the value of partnering with the right vendor. Um, yeah. You know, we're very traditional in healthcare. We always have been. There's some of us as leaders that are really shifting our minds to think differently, as Dr. King stated, you know, blowing up um, the, the old traditional processes. But this is exactly why um, the partnership and choosing the right technology, the right vendor, the right partner is so important because they help us to think very differently um, and get away from that traditional mindset. Right, and that ties back to your opening statement where you said you're looking for new solutions, new ways, and that's really, um, I've always, before COVID-19, I uh, uh, behind the, the scenes, I always said that, that uh, telehealth is a Trojan horse. Um, they, they, they invite me into the organization to help them redesign care delivery in isolated areas because they're fascinated by the dangling carrot of the telemedicine technology. But really for me, it's an excuse to come in and redesign healthcare delivery. <laughs> and so, and it's, it's very refreshing now to see that really straight out in the opening and that leaders are embracing and say, okay, that, I love that statement, Dr. King, uh, uh, let's wipe the safe clean. It's like, what should the ideal experience be like for patients and for the clinicians to really uh, uh, drive patient outcomes, to, to, to practice medicine, to deliver the best care. And yes, when fee-for-service reimbursement goes away and I have the liberty to, to uh, have a video chat and an interactive text chat um, uh, with my patient three times a day and not have to worry about whether I can bill for this three times. Um, but I think about what's best, um, then, then we're really gearing up to having uh, yeah, the technology and the mindsets uh, aligned really uh, an awesome uh, uh, healthcare experience. So, so Dr. King, so right, I mean, the waiting room shouldn't exist, right? Let's yeah. all tabula rasa swipe, you know, clean everything, right? But the reality is that we, we do live in a healthcare environment. It's highly regulated, it's entrenched, right? Everything, and for sometimes really, really good reasons, right? And, and 
how do you balance, especially for a group that's been on the front edge, and I, I think it's great you guys are here because both of you are leaders in this space, but you have a lot of anchoring points, right? The, the EMR is a billing system that is masquerading as a whole bunch of other things today. How do you balance those decisions, right? You can't just wipe it clean, like would love to do it, but that's not going to happen, right? How do you as a, as a leader, MUSC national leader, manage that? Hmm. And let me make sure I, I want to answer your question correctly. I think as a provider, it comes down to quality of care. Um, and so I think if you're saying, if your question is, how do you transform healthcare, but, you know, not feel shackled to the EMR and fee for service healthcare and, you know, reimbursement and, um, that environment, I think for providers, because when I say wipe the slate clean, that's always their uncomfort, right? But but how will I bill for that? And um, where where am I going to document? And you know, with all of those kinds of things, um, when it really comes down to, but could you could you take good care of your patient? Well, yes, I could take very good care of my patient. Um, okay, tell me how you would take very good care of your patient. Well, this is how I take very good care of my patient. Okay, well then let's build that. Um, and this EMR integration and, um, you know, uh, how we'll get reimbursed, we'll, we will um, figure that out on the back end. And I think that we've had, we've had great opportunity in South Carolina uh, to um, be forward thinking and to uh, take some risks. Um, in order to do that. Uh, but I hope that's answering your question. Yeah, I mean, it was just kind of open ended. I mean, I just I think it's such a, you know, it, it's tricky. And, and that's the that's where leadership comes in at this stage, right, of how do you navigate it, because you can't just wipe it clean. And, you know, the the anchoring bias financially, the dependency on the EMRs, and it's for a lot of really good reasons. But it doesn't, I think, you know, for this panel, it doesn't always provide the optimal experience. But it's right. always there, right? You know, it is always in the conversation. Um, yeah. So when 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 I joined healthcare uh, in the early two thousands, I was shocked and appalled what my software engineering profession had done onto healthcare. <laughs> so ever since then, I'm saying I'm doing penance for the sins committed by software engineering onto healthcare. It took me years to figure out that what you just summarized is that uh, the EMR was designed to uh, to be an optimized billing system, which I didn't understand at the time. I thought it was there to facilitate the physician the patient relationship, which is what it was not doing a good job at all. Um, and and it's, it's actually interesting. I started working with a health system client uh, uh, last year, and the first words out of the mouth before he even sat down of the CAO said, okay, when we do this, we have to have integration with the EMR. <laughs> that was just at the top of my mind, and I wholeheartedly agreed with him. Um, but how do we get to that integration, and, and whether we're actually collecting health uh, uh, information uh, during an interaction that maybe it's just a video visit, um, uh, th that is really then uh, taking a look at what is the patient experience, what, what data are we collecting, or are we just using video chat as a phone system or direct messaging, or is this really uh, uh, generated health data that has to live in the EMR? Um, and in, in Germany, we have this uh, funny idiom called an egg laying wool milk sow. So an animal that lays eggs uh, gives wool <laughs> as a sow, and 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 it's a metaphor for saying that uh, often people want everything out of out of one thing, right? It's 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 the copy fax machine that also makes coffee, right? <laughs> so um, and and now we have the EMRs doing uh, telehealth and telemedicine. Oftentimes they bought some other technology. And, and it's oftentimes not, an op, not a solution that is optimized. And I think that's, that's really the question is how, how do you make that decision as a healthcare organization and with the support of health IT to, to have the right solution? Um, and then we the all answer the question, but I wanna hear your action. It's, it's, well, what's the patient experience? What's the physician experience? And then that's the solution we have fit the bill. So 
Uh, well, mo moving into one other aspect here, uh, I, I want to. Uh, one of the questions, the first questions that came on here in the Q and A stream is: uh, telemedicine is limited by lack of diagnostic tests that the physician can use. How do we overcome that barrier? So again, to your point, John, earlier that uh, we can't wipe the uh, slate clean. Uh, we we have to replicate uh, a lot of the traditional healthcare uh, services, and so. Uh, uh, who, who would like to take a, uh, uh, their, uh, share their perspective uh, uh, on, on, on that aspect of diagnostic tests? Uh, maybe John, since you're unmuted here, start with you. Sure. Well, I mean, I, I think that is one of the areas that is changing so quickly in COVID specifically, right? I mean, you think about at-home testing and the advancements that have happened in the past 20, 12 to 14 months generally. And I, I think that will have an even bigger impact within virtual care and telemedicine as it gets more consumerized, as you know, devices like this get even better at being able to measure biometrics. So I, I think it, it has been somewhat of a rate limiter. Um, I wouldn't consider it to be a, a, the rate limiter in telemedicine by any means. There's a regulatory and reimbursement things. And actually, I think that the sophistication coming in consumer grade testing at home, low cost, um, is going to be really, really uh, transformative in the next few years. Yeah. I really think it's multifaceted. I think that, again, you have to think about the experience that you're trying to create. I think that at-home testing, at-home treatment, at-home care will become more and more prominent as we move forward. Now that people have gotten a little bit more used to receiving care in their home, but I also think that there will be times that they need to, to see someone in person and um, not to ever, ever be little healthcare at all, but think about when you order your coffee, if you order your coffee online, you do everything online to prep yourself, but you still go and get your coffee because the end result is you want the cup of coffee to drink and you don't mind going and picking up that coffee, but we want to make it very easy, very stream, uh, you know, streamlined painless experience until you go get that cup of coffee. Um, so I think that, you know, not to, again, make it too simple, but there's, it's all about the experience in its entirety and, and really figuring out what that sweet spot is for making sure that um, you're only asking someone to present in person when necessary, but doing absolutely everything to make everything leading up to that and their experience um, very, very easy, very all-encompassing, very positive. Great, Dr. King. Yeah, I mean, I would just get back to sort of the the clinical goals of the encounter or the the relationship. Um, and and I, to Abby's point, I'm, I would never say you you don't need diagnostic testing, you don't need a physical exam. Um, I'm not saying that at all, but I'm saying. If you say to a clinician, what is the information that you need to make a clinical decision? Tell me what information you need. Tell me what the goal of the interaction with your patient is. And let's see how we can get the information you need to make that clinical decision and achieve that goal of the encounter. And often that's not every diagnostic test. Um, and I think uh, when you start with that in mind, um, then you can design the, the experience such that we get the information we need to make the decision that we need to make. Um, so that would be my thought. Very good. Um, I, I, I want to bring up here one visual, if, if, if our technical support team could bring up uh, the, the one visual slide here just real quickly, just to paint a lens to really paint that landscape of, uh, of telehealth and telemedicine. And the question is really, and we, we talked about this uh, for a number of times um, on whether really uh, one, uh, one, one size can, can, can fit all. Um, uh, Eddie, if you could show, show that, bring that slide up, that would be great, wonderful there. Just, um, so the question is, can one size fit all? Um, well, in the way that I look at it, so there's, there's, there's multiple dimensions of, of, of healthcare. The first one is there's the over 12 and even more different uh, clinical specialties. The, um, I mean, you have primary care, you have specialty care. Um, on the next uh, dimension, then uh, we have different mo modalities. We have interactive uh, visits, we have asynchronous visits, we have uh, diagnostic visits that we've just talked about. We have remote patient monitoring um, that's continuous or that's asynchronous. And then on the next level, we have uh, the patient can be in different locations. They can be at home on their smartphone. They can be in a nursing home with a cart or they can be in a hospital bed with a cart next to it. 
Um, so there's so many different technologies involved in it. The, the fourth dimension then is uh, um, who are actually the, who are you connecting? Are you connecting your physicians to your patients or somebody else's specialists to your patients? And so there's different uh, scenarios and variations. And then the last one here is, uh, is it a pre-scheduled visit? Uh, are you gonna do this ad hoc and on demand, which has a, a lot of the workflow implications. And so if you then do the tongue in cheek math here of 12 times six times 12 times four times three, um, then you have a map that shows that we have the opportunity for 10,368 <laughs> different telehealth services. Um, and, and just by looking at the different dimensions here, I think um, one size, uh, from my perspective, uh, cannot fit all. We need to consolidate. We cannot train physicians on 12 different uh, solutions either. But remote patient monitoring is as is, is a different technology than a video visit for telestroke assessment or a pre-scheduled behavioral health visit. Uh, those are different use cases. And, and I love what you just said. Um, ask the clinicians, what information do you need in order to make a clinical decision? And then we'll give you the right tools. We give you a visit tool or a communication tool. We'll get you know, that, that, that data. So, so, so and, and, and any thoughts on this, uh, uh, on the, the 10,368 uh, telemedicine services and how to address them all with uh, technology solution? Would like to go first. John, yes. <laughs> Well, just use hypnosis. It's the easy answer, right? <laughs> All right, good, good, good answer. That's too easy. That's too easy. <laughs> no, I, I'm I kid, but it's it is you know it's it's daunting, and I, I I think that's kind of part of where we are at this stage of the industry is there is a lot of uncertainty, and we'll we'll continue to sort it out and, and get better. But um, I, I think the other thing that you know that it brings to mind when you think of all of those solutions, what it also doesn't play out is everything that's happening outside the four walls kind of effectively of, of traditional healthcare and how that's even making it more complicated um, and access points, you know, especially as consumer directed uh, services get more and more sophisticated. So I think it's, it's really, <laughs> Abby, Dr. King, I don't, you know, <laughs> you guys get your work cut out. <laughs> yes. Definitely a portfolio. We call it our digital portfolio all the time. Um, you know, I, I feel like I'm beating a dead horse here, but really it's about that journey and how does each solution fit into the journey? Um, you know, sometimes there's more than one thing that can be accomplished with a product and other times there's not. Um, I think that the industry has come a long way. And I think John just alluded to that. Um, it's, it's really important that we keep moving forward at lightning speed too. You know, companies are learning to work together each and every day to, to develop that solution set across the board. And I think that we'll continue to see that momentum increase. Um, people are leveraging that now, and, and that's going to be um, ever more important as time goes on. Very good. Dr. King, yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, that math right there is really what drove us to develop the, the what we have um, come to call the TSIM process or this standardized process of developing telehealth services. Um, and what's interesting is that when you go through the TSIM process and you ask, you choose your own adventure from each one of those lists, only about five things come out in the end. Um, it, uh, so it's a little bit more streamlined than you think in the end. Um, and, and people like John are making it easy for us um, yep. because they are thinking out of the box about uh, what, um, what the right solution, what we could reimagine. Um, and in reality, uh, that, that streamlines it as well. Great. All right, with about uh, 10 minutes left to go, I want to switch uh, to answering some of the uh, uh, questions that came up here. So uh, Dr. King and, and Abby, I'm going to give you a chance to read the Q&A session. I hope you can see that. because um, um, and, and, and John, I'm going to uh, uh, take the one here that was posted early on uh, to you, and I'm going to read it to you if you don't have it up here. Uh, so that's for John. How is hypnosis solving the problem of articulation by the patient and interpretation by the doctor care provider? Since patients can't talk to the care provider language, if you could comment on that uh, a question. Uh, if, if. Um, so is that about multilingual or? or uh, well, I, 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 was, uh, uh, I, was, I was thinking that- Oh, that was, sorry, yep, I see it now, okay. Okay. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, um, uh, it's an interesting um, user experience or to design um, problem to solve for. So, 
when, when you think about, but fortunately there's a, been a lot of progress in, in this and a lot of it's come outside of healthcare that we bring in as well. So one of the first things that, that we do when we create an experience that connects that consumer with a physician, the way we built the software was actually to allow us to have a totally different set of questions and language that the, the patient can see versus what's presented to the clinician. And that those are actually sort of separated. And that was a very intentional decision we made early on because we knew we had to have content at a third grade reading level for consumers. We knew we had to be able to say, you know, um, uh, burning with urination for a clinician makes a ton of sense and that's how they want to look at it, but you have to be able to rephrase it for the consumer in a different way. And so um, there are some things that we did specifically with hypnosis to make that facilitate that. And then you learn, right? You learn what works and you get feedback. And that's part of, part of what we bring to our partners is, a decade of doing that, right? You take it off the shelf and it works. It's never always perfect and it's always evolving, but we've, we've really kind of been able to kind of get through that. And we'll be able to apply that to more diverse populations. That's the exciting thing now about telemedicine is we're treating so many more people and different people. And, and that will continue to be an ongoing, you know, opportunity for us to enhance that experience to reach different populations, to overcome, you know, the challenges that present there. But for Zip specifically, we built that into our DNA, knowing that we were going to have to be able to solve for how does a consumer look at it? How does a provider look at it? And they don't always see the same thing and want the same thing. Yeah. And I think it goes to your earlier point of saying uh, uh, that uh, uh, I think Abby made the point uh, to, to, to team up um, with, with the right solution provider that is innovative, that is looking at new feature sets, or as Dr. King just mentioned, the people that are thinking outside the box on trying to anticipate uh, what the health systems are needing. So, so the right uh, uh, technology partner uh, is, is, is very much uh, key here. Um, so uh, Dr. King and Abby, there was a question about how to balance uh, virtual care medicine vendors as pure fulfillment or execution versus strategic partners, um, uh, reactions and thoughts on that question. I think it's definitely a combination of both. I think that you're going to have times like pandemic response where there's a lot of just do it moments where you need to get something up and functioning and, and quickly executed upon, but you always have to balance that with your strategic plan for your organization. I think partners like Zipnosis are really important in doing that. You know, we always joke that we're building the plane while we're flying it, but we really do always have an organizational strategic plan in place. And, you know, we talk uh, among our teams all the time that each and every piece of the work that you're doing should really fit and support that strategic plan. And I think it's really important right off the bat to communicate that with your partners. They need to know what our or overall organization goals are um, so that they can help us mold and develop those um, and support those along the journey as well. Very good. Yeah, Dr. King. Yeah, no, I would just agree. I think you need to be really... Um, uh, have a really solidified strategic plan of your own. Um, and so we had a very solidified strategic plan with buy-in um, at the highest levels at our healthcare system. Um, and then we could go find partners in that strategic plan. Um, and uh, certainly we used formalized processes for, for choosing those partners, um, but they have all been uh, folks that really wanted to, to partner with us to, to achieve our goals um, and, and innovate with us. Very good. And it's staying with you, Dr. King, since you are a pediatrician, uh, just to, let's take a moment and dive really deep into uh, one specific use case, because I think that's always helpful. Uh, well, child visits for young children. How do you see these evolving? The current practice uh, is more hands-on examining development, uh, all of that. Uh, so what, what, what is your take on that as a pediatrician? Sure. Well, I think I would, um, I would apply a lot of the, the conversations that we've he had here today. Um, wipe the slate clean. What are your clinical goals? What is the goal of each interaction you have with the patient? What do you want the patient's experience to be? Um, and now let's redefine that. So I want to, to, for children to be healthy. I want to give anticipatory guidance to parents. I want to make sure that children get their vaccines. Um, you know, these are just some of and are developing correctly. Those are some of the goals of a well child check. How do you order all the coffee before you get to the drive through window. So how do I achieve as many of those goals as possible um, in an experience that a, a parent and child would like to experience 
um, and, uh, and uh, get to the drive-through window. Um, that's what I think the, um, the well child check should look like. Right. Uh, the, the other thing that always comes up from in my mind is, uh, yes, we can compare telemedicine to in-person visits, um, uh, but what about if we compare telemedicine to no visit? <laughs> then telemedicine wins all the time. And I work a lot with rural healthcare organizations and, and in rural counties, and, and there the decision is not whether to have in-person uh, care or not. And we saw that with COVID-19, that's where everybody <laughs> went to virtual care. And so if the, uh, so, so telemedicine beats no visit every time. <laughs> um, and and in-person visits uh, are occasionally better, can be better um, than, than a virtual visit as well. And I think that's where you get into maintaining quality of care um, right. because everyone deserves high quality care. Um, and I think that is where then you ask yourself, is my um, is the tool that I am using to help reduce a healthcare disparity exacerbating a healthcare disparity? And yes. let me make sure that, that I'm not falling into that trap. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, I, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. I was actually going to uh, see. So, Dr. King, I know you. we heard some data that came from MUSC around, you know, sort of underserved populations. And that's a term in telemedicine that's evolved from rural to underserved because there are pockets in urban environments where you don't have access to the tools. And I, I think it's going to become even more important. So one of the things that we, we've done here at Zipnosis is really focus on more of an adaptive interview, right? We didn't just start with putting a video visit out there. The inspiration for that, for me, came uh, from looking at how cell phones were used in Africa as banks, right? And when you try to do something over a high bandwidth in environments that don't have that infrastructure, it's much harder. And I think, you know, as, as we think about solutions that are going to have broad lasting impact, we also have to think about, are we getting to the communities who need it? And are we thinking about the tools in that manner? Because most people do have cell phones, but not everybody has a high data plan and other things that go with it. And so I think, especially as telemedicine becomes more and more woven into our healthcare delivery experience, those questions are gonna to continue to you know, be a part of the calculus. Are we getting to that community? Does the technology help us do that? Good, thank you so very much. Um, so uh, I wanna do a last flash round here and it's, uh, it's a two part, you can pick a, one or both uh, questions. The, the first one is the one that is here on our screen uh, asking, uh, uh, who do you think will drive the digitalization of the doctor's office, patients, clinicians, insurance regulator, or who else? <laughs> um, so that's, that's, that's one question you can maybe quickly answer. And the other one, uh, uh, if I give you a magic wand today, what barriers, what, what things would you want to see go away or change over the next 18 months? So let's say by, by fall of 2022 um, in the telehealth world. So um, Abby, let's start with you here. Um, a magic wand or who's driving the digitalization of the doctor's office? Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna take the first one there. I'm I'm definitely gonna say the patients are driving um, and the industry is driving. You know, we've got a lot of players out there now who are not traditional healthcare um, or who had not focused their businesses in healthcare anymore. And I think that the combination of the industry. Um, and the market and the patients are definitely going to drive the future, and, and we all have to respond to that. I do want to get my my magic wand question in there too, though. Um, you know the reimbursement challenges. We have seen so much momentum. We've seen so much gain. We've seen so many barriers dropped um, the last 12 months with the relaxation of a lot of the um, regulations around reimbursement, and I think that that's. That's what I would definitely take my magic wand to moving forward um, is to really eliminate a lot of those barriers and challenges for healthcare organizations so that we can really create solutions that fit across the board for each and every person that we serve. Right. And eliminate them for good. So Dr. King. Eliminate them for good. <laughs> uh, so I, I guess to the first question, I would say all of the above. Um, you don't get to... Um, uh, you, you don't get to adversely affect anyone because then then there's a barrier. Um, so we're going to have to all come to the table there. Um, maybe I took, that might be the cop out um, answer to that question. Uh, and my magic wand, I think um, I agree with Abby that our, our first hurdle will be the reimbursement barriers. I think when those came down, all the, all the walls um, tumbled down. 
Um, but then maybe piggyback on, I, I think probably John and I were in Africa at the same time. Um, and I truly believe that if we step back and say, how can we get healthcare out to everyone? Um, and how can, if we're really genuine about not exacerbating healthcare disparities, I think it'll look a lot different. Um, and so that would be my hopes and dreams for the next 18 months. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. King. John. I think um, I think the patients are going to drive so much of this. I really I think the force is there. I, I like Abby's comment too on saying industry is also going to support it. Um, I think we're it, that's going to be driving. And then I think the reimbursement. If if it doesn't get better, I think that's where the the creative forces of the market will find gaps. And I, that's my concern is for if we don't put our arms around it and get rid of a lot of the, the hurdles on reimbursement. Um, I think patients are gonna start getting really creative with where they get care. Great. Well, thank you so very much. I mean, this was a fascinating conversation here. I really, really enjoyed it. And, and again, the themes that emerged here, right? It's, it's making it about the patient experience. It's, uh, I love this, wiping the slate clean and asking the clinicians, what do you really want to have available to you to make clinical decisions? And let's help you design a solution uh, around that, uh, really shifting the paradigms. And yes, let's put all of our magic wands together and, <laughs> and get and make those reimbursements go away, the shift over to value-based care so that people, uh, and then it's going to be much more you know, easier to get access to care to, to everyone in the modality that makes the most sense, whether that's text, texting or whether that's video or asynchronous experiences. So um, so I think uh, we're, we're, we, we put together a nice mixed cocktail here, but I think there's an expert coming on next here to, uh, to show us how uh, a, a, a real good afternoon cocktail, which I'm ready for, <laughs> is going to be mixed. So, so again, thank you to for Zygnosis for uh, instigating this event and for, for bringing Abby and, and, and Dr. King here to the table. Really, really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks for help for hosting this, uh, promoting it, and, and really making this a great experience for our, all four of us here. We felt very good, well taken care of. And I saw the registration open for the health uh, event in Boston uh, now for virtual and in-person. So go over there and uh, maybe see some of you uh, in person on the floor with maybe a cocktail in hand. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. I'll hand it back here to the organizers. Thank you. Thank you, Christian, and to all of our panelists. If you would like to continue the conversation, please join us on Twitter. And now, please welcome Master Mythologist Natasha. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Natasha Soto Albors, and I'm a New York based mixologist. Um, my company is called Violet and Vine of New York. And, you know, of course, being a restaurant bartender during the pandemic was a unique challenge. And um, all of the quarantine periods sort of dictated a shift to embracing virtual events. And that's something that I've been doing over the past um, year and more now, um, kind of bringing elevated craft cocktails into your living room and teaching you how you can get that really wonderful cocktail bar experience um, right at home. So I'm going to make two cocktails today. One is actually going to be a zero proof cocktail or mocktail if you prefer that term. Um, I think that mocktails should always be just as interesting and playful as our cocktails, including spirits. So I really try to be inventive with those recipes. Um, and then the first thing we're going to start with, though, is our cocktail, which I chose to do a rye based cocktail today. For those who aren't as familiar with rye, um, rye is in the whiskey family, obviously. And you know, bourbon is something that a lot of people maybe are more comfortable drinking. They're more used to having it in cocktails. So when you have a bourbon, it's all about grain content. And that's what really distinguishes between whiskeys. So a bourbon is actually more corn in the mash and a rye has at least 50% rye grain in the mash. Um, if you think of the difference between like a rye bread and other bread that you have, you know that it has that sort of a little bit darker, spicier, earthier flavor. And definitely when you're having a rye whiskey, that difference comes out in the drink as well, or if you're drinking it straight, which is also delicious. Um, but today I'm kind of looking forward to summer as I think we all are, and we're definitely getting some nice spring weather, not so much today um, here in the Northeast, but in general, it's warming up. So while I'm doing a whiskey cocktail, I wanted to keep it light. I wanted to keep it refreshing and play with some citrus flavor because I think that actually works beautifully with the rye. So my other ingredients, I made a cardamom simple syrup for today. 
I love cardamom. It's awesome in coffee. It's awesome with citrus. The cool thing about this simple syrup is once you make it, you can store it in the fridge for four to six weeks. Um, I've been putting it in my oat milk latte in the morning since I made it. It's really delicious, but it's also great in this cocktail. So the way I made the cardamom simple syrup, I boil equal parts sugar and water, about a cup of each, on the stove, put it on high heat. Um, and then once it comes to a boil, I actually threw in a tablespoon of whole cardamom pods. So you can get those in the spice section at most grocery stores. Whole Foods is always a great resource for that. Um, and before you put in that, that teaspoon of cardamom pods, you'll just want to kind of crush them a little bit with a knife, kind of almost crack them in half. And they go straight into that hot mixture of sugar and water. The sugar's dissolved at that point. You take it off the heat. You just let the cardamom sit and let the syrup come to room temperature. Let it cool down all the way. Once it's cool, you just strain out the cardamom pods and boom, you have a really wonderful flavored syrup. And again, you'll want to store it in your fridge so that it has longevity. That is the secret ingredient today on this rye cocktail. Um, and then I'm using some fresh grapefruit juice as well and a little bit of grapefruit seltzer. So I'm going to build this out for you just piece by piece, telling you the proportions. Um, we're going to start with rye. I am using Rough Rider Rye, Rough Rider Rye, Bull Moose Rye Whiskey is the actual product. And I'm going to go ahead and do two ounces of that right into my shaker. So generally with cocktails, we're always looking for balance, right? We have the, the base spirit. We want something with a little acid to it. That's where the grapefruit comes in really beautifully. I'm just going to give it a little shake. I squeezed my own fresh grapefruit juice. If you have time to do that, it makes a big difference with drinks. If not, buying the freshest version of that that you can find at the store is really, really smart. Um, I'm going to do one whole ounce of grapefruit. Again, I'm going for citrus in this drink, so it'll be a little tart. Um, and then I'm going to do three quarters of an ounce of my cardamom simple syrup that I told you about. That goes right in as well. The last ingredient, just a little touch, um, bitters. Bitters are always really fun. They add like a little base note to our cocktail. I'm actually using lime bitters today, which is a unique flavor of bitters we don't play with as much behind the bar. And the brand on these is Scrappy's Bitters. Um, they have all kinds of great flavored bitters. You can order them online. They'll ship them directly to you. So I'm gonna just do three dashes of that, my lime bitters. And then I'm ready to shake. So I'm gonna add a piece. assembled here and give this a good shake. It always looks a little bit dramatic when we shake cocktails, but there's a reason we're trying to get it as cold as can be. We want the citrus juice to really froth up and for everything to be very well combined. Um, so I have that all ready to go. I'm using a Collins glass for this drink that's also called a highball. And I'm going to strain my, my cocktail right into it. So you'll see it'll come up a little more than halfway up the glass. That's the way it should look because we haven't added ice yet. We always do that last so we don't water down the drink too, too much. And then I am putting some fresh ice cubes into the glass. The last step here, I'm using um, just a grapefruit seltzer, something that you'll drink a lot in the summertime, I'm sure. Top the drink with that. Use my bar spoon, give it a little stir just so that the seltzer combines nicely into there. And then for my garnish on this, I'm doing a long grapefruit spiral. I'm just gonna bring it to the camera so you can see it a little more closely. Um, I cut a really long spiral of grapefruit and using um, my knife, I kind of cleaned up the edges of it and I twist it just like so. Uh, it takes a few kind of spirals to get it to act like a little coil or spring. And I lay it right on top of the drink. And again, you'll see it has this gorgeous kind of spring color, really, really fun grapefruit spiral across the top. And I've called this one Bittersweet Symphony because it definitely has that sweet quality from the cardamom syrup, but it's subtle and then a really nice like citrus quality from the grapefruit. So that's our first one. Our second one is our non-alcoholic cocktail. Again, um, I love playing with interesting flavors for these. I think it's awesome when you can go beyond just club soda with a little bit of lemon juice in it. We can really um, go all out and make this just as much fun. So um, this one's called Island Time. Basically, it, at its heart, it's like a really fun limeade. It's gonna have bright lime flavor. I'm actually doing um, one and a half ounces of fresh lime juice. 
So that's a good amount of lime. You definitely want to be a, a sour person, but we're going to balance it with some other flavors, of course. Um, we're going to do three quarter ounces of honey syrup. Honey syrup is very similar to simple syrup. You basically make it by combining, um, you can do equal parts honey and water, or you can do a little bit less water if you want a thicker honey syrup. So I'm doing three quarters of an ounce of my honey syrup, and then super fun sort of island ingredient here, coconut milk. Um, I use canned coconut milk. If you wanna go that extra mile and get fresh coconut milk, by all means, crack the coconut and go for it. But it, it's delicious to use the canned version and it works beautifully in the drink. So I'm doing three quarters of an ounce of my coconut milk. And then two more ingredients, we're almost there. So um, three sprigs of thyme. Thyme is not something we see in cocktails a lot, but we do see mint and basil and other herbs. So we're kind of used to that idea of putting herbs in our cocktails. This is just um, a little different one. And I think it's really, really awesome in this. And then I had to add some heat here because why not do a spicy non-alcoholic? So I have fresh jalapeno. I've cut it and I've left the seeds and the membranes in the pepper. Um, if you're not a person who likes spicy, if you're the person who orders your guacamole mild, you'll want to cut out the membranes or you could even just leave the jalapeno out of the drink. Um, if you are a spice addict, go for it, leave in the seeds. And I'm going to do three slices because I personally really want it to have a punch. And those are all my ingredients. I'm going to add ice. We're going to shake this one up. Important to shake very vigorously. You want all that hot pepper to get to mine. And that should just about do it. Now, I'm going to do this one over a big ice cube. Um, big ice cubes, you can find the molds online. And um, what's really fun about this, it gives us that cocktail bar feeling in our living room. So it's a silicone ice mold that just makes an extra large square ice cube. So I put my ice cube in a short rocks glass for this one. Double strain this cocktail. What I mean by that is I'm going to use a fine mesh strainer in addition to the regular strainer on my cocktail shaker because we had all that jalapeno and thyme and we just kind of threw it right in there, but we want to strain it out so the drink has a cleaner look and sort of a cleaner finish here. So I'm going to go ahead and double strain over my big ice cube. The color is really fun. It's got kind of a really light um, lime popsicle kind of color is how I would describe it. And then I'm going to take one fresh sprig of thyme, just pick a good looking one here, and I'm going to lay it right on top of that big ice cube, and that is island thyme. I'll, I'll bring it a little closer so you can see. So again, we have that beautiful, you know, big ice cube, sort of whitish green color, perfect for spring. Give it a little taste because you have to do that. Definitely good. It definitely has a really awesome kick to it. The coconut comes through beautifully. The lime, if you are like a pina colada kind of fan, I would definitely suggest trying this. And if you wanted to turn this mocktail into a cocktail, the addition of rum would be really lovely, or you could actually do Blanco tequila in this as well. Something a little different, but you have tons of options and flexibility. So again, my name is Natasha Soto Albors. You can find me on Instagram at Violet and Vine of NY. And I'm always happy to offer cocktail tips. We'll be posting lots of spring and summer recipes. So be sure to check it out. And I hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much.